Hello, you join me today at the wheel of a 2001 Jeep XJ Cherokee. A truly game-changing vehicle in terms of four-wheel drives and indeed SUVs of the future. Everything copied it since then. So join me for a ride in this fascinating 4x4 which is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classics at Rootham in Kent. And if you'd like to see more reviews of interesting and exciting vehicles from around the world then do please hit the subscribe and bell notification buttons down there. Now on with the review. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving and today we're going all redneck with a Jeep Cherokee XJ. Now as you know I'm no great fan of SUVs for the sake of it but I do like four wheel drives and I do like firsts and this is something of an innovator because not only is it a proper four wheel drive from a proper four wheel drive company, the American Land Rover if you will, the Jeep Cherokee XJ series was a game changer when it came to the four wheel drive as a family car. It was marketed as a sport wagon before the term sport utility vehicle was a thing. But pretty quickly these things with their blend of off-road ability and practicality and family lifestyle go anywhere do anythingness started to steal sales from actual station wagons. And this is why the SUV craze has taken off. Although the cars that are now passing for SUVs are a pale comparison compared to this chunky proper off-road beast. So looking at the styling of this thing, it is unmistakably Jeep. You've got the seven opening grille, which is a trademark of the brand. You've got the chunkiness, the off-roadiness, the very squareness of the early 80s. There's a couple of notable firsts with this car. This is the first American non-military unibody off-roader. Everything prior to this was body on frame. It's also Jeep's first brand new ground up blank sheet design since 1963. Now talking about dates, the XJ series ran from 1983 until 2001 in America and 2014 globally. And this particular car started life being exported to Japan. Now there was a previous Mark 1 Cherokee which ran from 1974 until 1983, but that was based on the previous generation Wagoneer, which had been designed by Brock Stevens way back in 1963. Now incredibly the design for this thing goes all the way back to 1978. Back then Jeep were involved were well, owned by AMC and AMC were involved with Renault. And that type meant there was lots of ideas sharing between the Americans and the continental Europeans. So with the Americans working under a guy called Dick Teague who was in charge from the American side, working with his French counterpart, they started with a first generation Cherokee basis and started sketching and clay forming around that until they came across something more or less like this. But the early ideas were very heavily European influenced. Now initially this was just going to be a two door, but then AMC got wind of the Blazer coming out and that was going to be a four door and that meant they had to grow an extra pair of doors on the back of this thing. Now one of the things that makes this car so good is the construction method. Yes it's unitary monocoque shell, but it's got an integral box ladder chassis built into that monocoque shell so it's the best of both worlds and it's still 544 kilos lighter than the previous generation. That's 1200 pounds if you know money. Now this style of the bonnet being a, just a square panel opening from within the design architecture of the car is such an American thing. European cars would pretty much never have that happen. This front panel would always be part of the bonnet on a European car. Certainly in later American cars they followed suit. Now where is the strut? Now, I'm pretty sure that says plop just there. It shouldn't do. Now under this particular bonnet we find Jeep's indestructible six cylinder four litre petrol. This engine is an absolute legend of a unit, it's the kind of thing Volvo 240s dream of when they're having hard times. But it wasn't the only option, the car was sold around the world with a number of different options. In America this was kind of the default choice, however there was also a two and a half litre four cylinder petrol believe it or not, that only made 105 horsepower. If you wanted a little bit more, if you wanted a little bit more oomph, there was a 2.8 litre V6 petrol which made 110 horsepower. I wasn't particularly aware of this one previously, but there was also a 2.1 diesel, still making 85 horsepower. And the most popular one here in the UK was a 2.5 litre diesel, which made 114, so it had a little bit of go and tended to be um, attached to a, a uh, manual gearbox. This though is the one everyone thinks of, the one everyone wants. It's a 4 litre petrol, 173 horsepower, which comes with an automatic almost by default, as far as I... And it comes with an automatic as kind of a default, because American car, 4 litres, is going to be an auto. This one's quite interesting because it's a Japanese car, everything all these little warning labels are in Japanese, so I'm going to assume don't put your fingers in places. Even the Bosch battery has got Japanese labelling on it. This is actually quite incredible. I've never seen a Japanese spec Jeep before. Oh God, beep, beep, beep. What is it with American cars? Oh, oh shut the door and oh, peace. Now, 
This is quite interesting sitting in this car because you're set up off-road height, big view of the road ahead. However, this car is contemporaneous. Oh. And point the camera at me for the saying this. This car is contemporaneous with things like the Range Rover Classic, which came out obviously in the 1970s, but was still broadly unchanged by the 1980s. However, in the Range Rover, you step up and you sit high and your feet are kind of sat on a flat floor, almost like you're in like an early E-type or something. Whereas this, you sit up high, but the seat feels higher off the ground in the floor of the car. So your feet have got somewhere to go. This feels better planned, like they thought through how the humans are actually gonna fit into it a little bit better than they did with things like the Range Rover. So this is a big step forward in terms of ergonomics as well as what the car is around you. Now let's take a look at this interior. Now again, this is a Japanese spec car, so all of our controls are labeled in Japanese for the most part. There are some English bits as well. The power outlet is in, in English writing. Then the, uh, the writing on the radio is in English as well, interestingly enough. But let me get down to all the uh, important stuff about the transmission and the two-wheel, four-wheel drive kind of stuff. And that is all in Japanese. So let's hope we don't get confused by that at any point during our drive. Now, let's look at these doors. Now, this car is quite a late example. So things have been facelifted and brought up to date quite extensively inside the car. We'll notice that as we look at everything else around. So on the door cards, we've got a large, well, it looks like it's going to be padded, but it's only kind of soft touch rather than actually padded. Um, big area up here at the back, and that's above a nice little wooden insert strip to make the car look a bit posh. This car, I should say, has got literally every option you can think of on it. It's just as loaded as it comes. So let me get into the controls and the buttons. It's a, interestingly not a metal door pull, like a plastic door pull, and a plastic button there for your door, door locks. And in front of it, we've got this panel here with our electric mirrors, electric windows, window lock. Very interesting American style of chunky buttons, and you can see how it was a flat door 20 years previously in the early 80s, and they've had to kind of extend this around and invent ways of making this whole door architecture hold all of this new stuff, including big speakers down there, tweeters up at the top, and very, very slim door pocket down there, which is plastic lined, so I can imagine that being a little bit loud if you put too much of a heavy thing in there. It's carpet lined on the outside though, so not completely bad. Now moving on to the dashboard, it's a big flat topped area, and you notice these air vents, as I said, things look a bit more 1990s than uh, they would have done back in the 1980s for the simple reason it was the 1990s. And I think this car is actually a 2001. I'm just gonna check the number plate. I've forgotten what car I'm sat in. But it's still very angular. They've done a little bit to soften the curves of time, um, but we have got excellent, oh no, oh no. I thought I was gonna say excellent T-shell free, but no T-shell fail. I thought there'd be plenty of room for your big gulp and your giant Mac and whatever else, but no, we've only got our two little cup holders, which don't actually look that stable, to be perfectly honest. I am, I am shocked. Shocked, I tell you. So anyway, I got as far as the air vent and then distracted by the dash top. Now these air vents in the center are also very, very modern looking. They've given the car, I was gonna say euthanized, but that's a different thing entirely to what I'm trying to say. They've brought youth to the, um, interior of the, the car with this modern styling. Surrounded by more of this faux wood stuff, which is in very nice condition, we have to say. And a quite an impressive radio. And this is a weird thing that a lot of American cars do seem to have, which is this kind of din and a half size radio. Most cars either have a single din, which is a standard size unit, or a double din, which is twice as high, which kind of makes sense. But a lot of American cars go for this din and a half, which is just really awkward because you cannot replace it with anything at all. Kind of annoying. That's above our air conditioning and ventilation. So interestingly, it's not an actual on off switch anywhere for the air conditioning. You just choose to go left turn if you want ventilation with air con, right turn if you want ventilation without air con. Single zone, oh dear me, how will we live? And that's above a panel of big chunky buttons for our fog lights, rear wiper, that kind of stuff, cigarette lighter and a power outlet. Now that's interesting, we've got a power outlet and a lighter. So we've got a double up on that thing there. Interesting, huh? Now. Let's move back to this dashboard, which we managed to skip a minute ago. Uh, we've got everything we could possibly need. We've got voltage, fuel, oil, water, and of course, speed and revs. Although we will notice that because it was a Japanese car originally, the speed is in kilometers per hour. So you might want to stick some little labels on that or learn to do quick maths. Pulling back, we've got a leather steering wheel, which does feel nice. It's not as big as you might imagine for such a big car as this. Uh, center is a horn 
wow, they do horns properly in America. That is truly parpy. And this steering wheel, again, with the loading of toys, does have cruise control on off on the left and other stuff on the right. There's no radio controls on there, just cruise. And then just ordinary indicators and wipers on the stalks, you know, the usual kind of stuff. And I can't do this one-handed, but the steering wheel can be adjusted up as well as down. Now, one thing that does strike me as interesting is it has a warning light switch. It's not bright red, it's not illuminated, it's not even transparent with a bulb in it. It's just a plain black plastic sliding switch. Shines up here when it's working, but when it's not on, it's just literally that thing there, which is kind of hard to see, especially in an emergency. Now, curiously, the headlight switch is down here. It looks like a choke pull, but with a light image on it. Just pull it once for side lights, twice the main, or dip beam. Interesting, and that's down here by the ignition, and you'll notice, a boy, does this thing beep thanks to that? Oh dear me. Now let's get back to the main other stuff around the car. Oh, how did I miss this? It's got a joystick like in a Ford Orion to choose where you want the sound stage to be, front, back, left, right, all that kind of good stuff. I didn't know this was going to be on here. I've just made my day. I liked this car already, but then found that and suddenly I've just got 10 times better. Now moving back, we have got automatic transmission because it's four litres, that's kind of a given. We've got our transfer and ratio selection gubbins two-wheel four-wheel drive part-time four-time low four-wheel drive low because it's a proper proper road it's even got four-wheel drive low ratio so we can climb mountains in this car we've got two stage heated seats on both the front seats we are properly properly specced out here two cup holders here in the center although as i say not that uh tight not that restraining although if you do need a cup to go on your next expedition then do head over to the Redbubble store and find these furious driving cups available on the Red Bubble store, there'll be a link somewhere in this video. Big armrest in the center, giving us plenty of support, and that has got room for many, many, many cassettes in there and more stuff. Let's have a quick look across to the passenger door. We've got one little switch for your door lock, and we've got an electric toggle switch, identical, but on its 90 degree side for the windows. And these seats, let's have a quick look at these seats. These are very comfy and swooshy, you sink deep into them and not much in the way of lateral support to look at. We've not driven the car yet, but we'll find out that in a second. But they are nice, soft leather and very hard wearing by the look of it as well. Finally, we have got a big airbag panel here. Interesting, another American thing is the big flat dashboards. They seem to have these big flat panels of nothing with just maybe a bit of wood or texture or something and call it a dashboard. That's very common on American cars. And a surprisingly small glove box considering how much dashboard real estate they have. One final thing is check out this thing. I have not seen anything like this since the Alpha 90 we looked at a little while ago, which is an astonishing car. Do check out that video if you haven't seen it already. We've got our interior lights, individually left and right, and we've got sunglasses holders for everyone, if you want to sit in the front anyway. And this continues aircraft style all the way to the back. We've got more individual lights in the rear. Speaking of which, let's take a seat in the back and see what it's like. Now climbing in, it's surprisingly tight on the head as you climb in. You do have to actually duck and squeeze past this wheel arch. It's not great for climbing in if you're an adult. I'm surprised at how little room there actually is for a grown-up in the back of this car. Definitely room for the kids. It, the front passenger seat is pushed a fair way forward compared to the driver's one, and there's a lot of leg room just there. But for me, where there's a, a person of grown-up size, in the front, there's not a lot of space. In the back, we have got oops, an ashtray in the center. We've got little cubby thingies there, and we've got a bit more tiny fake wood trim in the back. The seats, again, very comfortable, soft, nice leather, but again, very little in the way of lateral support for us. Big headrests though, and this will all, of course, fold down completely. One thing I've just noticed, which is missing from this car, but the bracket is still there, is that little clamp down there for the road flare. Japanese cars always have to carry one of those in the passenger footwell. Now, before we climb into the back, I'll mention this tinting. This is factory tint on this car. This is how it left the, uh, the factory like that. That's not an aftermarket thing. Big handle to get you in there. It is a, and it is a 2001, I was right. Nice size boot. And this, interestingly, is an original accessory as well, which pretty much always goes missing. I don't think I've ever seen one but this car does still have it that's clips in there underneath that we have got two little lockers one's got the cd changer in it one's just a storage bay 
On the other side, full-size spare wheel, completely blocking any vision at all out of that window. The boot goes back a fair way, so we can carry a lot of stuff. This is an extremely practical vehicle, and the seats, of course, do fold forward, as I said. So all your going into the woods to do whatever you do in the woods with large items that need to be disposed of in the woods, needs are catered for by the Jeep Cherokee XJ. Now the first thing you notice about this 4 litre straight 6 is how utterly effortless it is to pull away. It's got a wonderful growl from the exhaust pipe and the engine is fairly muted but still got a little bit of grrr. I mean this car has only got 43,000 kilometres on it which is about 30, low 30,000 miles ish. So it's barely run in and it's as it would be when it was new. And it's one of those engines that kind of suits an automatic because it's big and it's lazy. It's not fast revving, but it's easy going and it kind of suits the, the old slush matic behind it. In terms of gearbox choices, you can have a manual, mostly with the diesels though, which is a four speed or a five speed, or you could get an automatic, which was either a three speed or a four speed. This one being a fairly late, absolute top whack everything spec from Japan, I believe is a four speed auto. Now the ride is typical old school four by four. It's a little bit wobbly, a little bit jolty. You kind of blobble along the road. You feel the bumps a little bit. When they were designing it, Dick Teague from uh, Jeep did say he wanted to make it feel like a proper off-roader and like a proper Jeep. He didn't want it to feel like an on-road comfortable SUV thing, even though it didn't exist at the time. It does have that old school feel about it, even though it's got a lot of modern touches. The accelerator pedal just takes the lightest touch and it just surges and you can feel the big engine just wanting to launch. Being a fairly big car with all the weight over the front axle, the steering is well assisted. So it's actually rather light on the wheel. And you can feel that it is old school four wheel drive because even though it's light and doesn't take a lot, there's a certain resistance still in the system. So it takes a little tiny bit of effort just to keep it turning in the direction you want it to go. It's not difficult and it's not unpleasant. It's actually quite a nice feeling of being involved in driving the car because you can feel a little bit of pushback from somewhere down there. It feels like an actual machine. Now this, surprisingly for an American car, is something of a world car. They've built it in a lot of places. They came out of Toledo, Ohio for the American market. Beijing, Egypt, Venezuela, Argentina. Overall, three million were built, and they did a lot of different variations as well. There was a 190 horsepower police package, which came with no interior rear door handles, so your crims couldn't get out the back. They did two door versions, as well as this four door. They did a two door version, as well as this four door. They even did a pickup truck version, although it wasn't badged as an XJ, that had a different name, I believe. And from 1985, a cheaper two-wheel drive only version was offered as an on-road only version. And one of the most interesting variants that came out of the production line was the US Postal Service version. And because the US Postal Service used vehicles which have got the driver's seat on the right-hand side, so they're next to the pavement, or the sidewalk if you're in America, so that ingenious idea meant they suddenly had a right-hand drive car they could sell to right-hand drive markets. So places like Britain suddenly had access to the Cherokee. Fantastic! And of course Japan also being right-hand drive market, which is where this car first went when it was brand new. And But the car had been sold in Europe as a left-hand drive since 1985. The wonderful thing about Japanese import cars that have been exported to Japan and then imported someplace else, apart from their horrifically stringent tax rules meaning we get great bargains, is they don't use salt on their roads. So you get a car with, in this case, very low mileage that's never been exposed to all the salt and nastiness that destroys European cars. So it's a win all round for us. Now, a few years ago, when there was talk of the Land Rover Defender coming to an end, something I was saying to all and sundry was, go and buy yourself a Cherokee now while they're 800 quid, because those are the next best thing, in fact, in many cases, actually better than a Defender. Grab one of those, you'll be laughing as an investment. Like I used to say with Porsche 911s when they were five grand, 
And once again, I've been proved correct because no longer are there minty 800 pound Cherokees. They're now sort of nudging 15, 20, even 30,000 pounds for mint examples. So once again, my radar, my little uh, feelers of automotive investment was correct. Sadly, my wallet was empty at the wrong time as always. Now driving down a bumpy road like this, you can tell the underpinnings are very much 4x4 orientated. It's got solid axles front and rear. In the back it's got leaf springs, in the front though it's got something designed by a chap called Roy Lunn called Quadralink, which is a bit more exciting and impressive, and that's got four links, hence the word quadra, two above and two below, locating the axle nice and square, making on-road manners a little bit more, well, well-mannered but you still can feel it lurch and jolt and jump in an old school manner. But then, as Dick Teague said, we want this thing to feel like a car you can take into the back country. And he wasn't wrong, this does feel like a car you can take anywhere. It's got that real feeling of tough, solid dependability. And he wasn't wrong, it's got that feeling of tough, solid, durable dependability. And these were an enormously popular car, as I said, three million sold. That was a hugely popular first car when they got old and cheap in America, because parents could buy one for their teenage kids, knowing it was a fairly safe thing that would get them through most situations. Now this is another of those cars, a bit like the Volvo 200 and 700, that was destined to only live a short life but went on for a long, long time. This was due to be replaced in 1993 by a newer, bigger variant called the ZJ. But even after a decade, the thing was still selling so well, they, they couldn't pull the plug on it. So they just turned the uh, bigger Cherokee into the Grand Cherokee and kept on selling this thing. Now one thing that does make it feel a little bit like a car from a while ago is the brakes. They are strong, you can push hard on the pedal and the car stops well enough, but they're discs at the front, drums on the rear, so you don't have that same bite you get in things like the Range Rover. Now in 1997 it did get a refresh on the exterior, so new side mouldings, new front grille, I guess including those plastic bumpers where previously it had been, been steel bar type. Also got new door handles, which they look a bit more modern. And the tailgate, interestingly, went from a fiberglass unit to a steel one, which is uh, unusual. Normally you go the other way around to avoid rust. Maybe they thought the fiberglass ones were so good at not rusting, they could put a steel one on now, I, I suppose. A couple of things that do make this car very, very American. First of all, on the passenger mirror, we have got the objects in the mirror are closer than they appear, which is that standard emblem all American cars do seem to have, in case you forget. Every time you stop, you can feel the torque of the engine fighting the brakes. And sometimes if you pull into a junction fairly quickly, it does feel a bit like a losing battle. Ah, uh, do you know what? This is one of those cars that I've had my eye on as I ought to go and buy one of those for a long time. And now I know I should have done. I am now seriously regretting not picking up one of these back when they were a grand or two. Maybe I should go and start scouring the classifieds and looking for one of those bargains that are out there. Maybe there's an owner out there who hasn't realised that the prices of these things has gone up significantly. I can go and grab one before they all hit £20,000. Maybe not, I don't know. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this rather wonderful, more than a survivor, this impeccable, perfect Jeep Cherokee. It's a car that I've always had a half an eye on as something I'd quite like to own one day. I think, once again, I've probably missed the boat. Never mind. If you've enjoyed watching, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.